Welcome to the 2008 HBOT Symposium recorded live on July 20th through the 27th, 2008. This module features Dr. Fred Kramer presenting HBOT Seizure Disorder. And now to introduce our speaker is Donald Jolly, PhD and Chairman of the Hyperbaric Oxygen Research Institute. Dr. Kramer is creative, knowledgeable, articulate, he is a pioneer in hyperbaric medicine. Being in hyperbaric medicine for almost 30 years makes him a pioneer by our standards in the United States in terms of where we are. And Dr. Kramer holds the record in terms of having a phone call with me. I don't like being on the telephone. When I talk to him, I am so enthralled by his knowledge and the balance of what he knows and shares, I am absolutely so captured that I go on and on and on and on and I was shocked to find that he is the longest telephone conversation I have ever had with anyone. I hope you enjoy his presentation. It will really expand your knowledge about seizure disorder. It's a little bit uh, unusual for a general surgeon to talk about seizures but before I get into my talk I want to relay a story. Winnie will remember this I'm sure. Uh, we had a wonderful time in Malta in 2001 with Richard. But I first met Richard Neubauer in 1979. And I'd like to tell this story because it really illustrates, I think, how far ahead he was from everyone else. I had just started my hyperbaric fellowship uh, with the Air Force, and I was at that time very skeptical about any of this. And I'd been there about a month or so, and Dr. Neubauer in 1979 was quite controversial, as we will remember, because he was so far out in front. And a telephone call came in, and Dr. Neubauer was calling from Florida uh, to uh, the school because uh, he wanted to talk with a hyperbaric physician to get approval for payment. Uh, the way the military works uh, is everybody on active duty has their bills paid, uh, whether it's a civilian emergency hospital or not, and uh, Dr. Neubauer had a patient. So I had the opportunity to get on the phone and uh, speak to Richard, and rather than some type of a radical thinker, he sounded very uh, logical, very intelligent, very thoughtful on the telephone. And the story was he had a young 25-year-old active duty Air Force troop who had had a motor vehicle accident, severe head trauma, and had been uh, semi-comatose. He got into Dr. Neubauer's facility and been treated now for about 30 treatments and was waking up and doing very well. And about to be discharged, back to active duty, and Dr. Neubauer wanted to try to get the bill paid, and that's why he was on the phone. Well, long story short, uh, I was able to, of course, approve the payment from a hyperbaric standpoint. And uh, we uh, developed a relationship over the years. And my wife and I were in Malta in 2001, and Winnie and Richard were there. We had a wonderful time at the UBS meeting. Uh, but he's a genuine pioneer, and it's a pleasure uh, for me to be on the program. When Dr. Jolly offered me uh, an opportunity to talk, I had to come up with some type of topic. I've always been uh, very much into paradoxical issues in hyperbaric oxygen, which are, they're not what they seem to be, and I'll talk about ischemia reperfusion briefly in a moment. But seizures have always been interesting because the classical teaching is that high-dose oxygen causes seizures and people who have seizures should not be put in a chamber. And that was my training uh, 30 years ago and uh, is still the norm. Now, I'm going to try and see if this advances. Yes, it does. <clears throat> Basically, the present situation is high-dose oxygen. Uh, we have to think about oxygen toxicity because it does, in fact, cause seizures. And therefore, there's a contraindication of hyperbaric treatment. Epilepsy, however, even though this slide will portray it as the same, may very well be a different situation. 
But the conventional wisdom today is if someone has a history of epilepsy or a diagnosis of epilepsy, they should not go in the hyperbaric chamber. The neurology community, my understanding is, believe that's because it lowers the seizure threshold. In looking through the literature, uh, I don't believe there is a shred of evidence that this is true. Seizures caused by oxygen toxicity are clearly too much oxygen. It's the brain's way of letting us know that enough is enough. But this is not an epileptic seizure. Epileptic seizures are different. And as we'll talk about here, the bottom line is the neurological epilepsy community, from what I'm told, understands that seizure foci are hypoxic. And so to me, this uh, makes a very, very uh, uh, simple conclusion. Well, a little bit of history. Uh, oxygen toxicity uh, in the chamber is the Paul Burt effect, we call it. And Paul Burt was a very prominent physician physiologist in France in the late 19th century. Uh, he worked under uh, Claude Bernard in Paris and actually succeeded him. And basically, he wrote a pioneer text which is reprinted uh, in uh, the 1960s in barometric pressure. And he is the first person to describe central nervous system oxygen toxicity. And if you take a normal person like those of us in the room and put us on oxygen at three atmospheres, 66 water, for one hour, 5% of the general population will have a grand mal seizure. I know this because in the old days, we used to, the Navy used to require this before they became a diver. I'm told now no, no longer do this. And many an hour I spent in the chamber at Brooks uh, with a young candidate breathing 100% oxygen and we'd watch them very closely. And when the ones were going to have a seizure at about 50 minutes or so, they would start to look around and twitching, at which point they failed the oxygen tolerance test. <clears throat> The Navy no longer does this, but at four atmospheres in 60 minutes, all of us will have a grand mal seizure. Uh, the transition from operational medicine, such as I'm a flight surgeon as well as a obsolete Air Force navigator. <clears throat> My wife says I have to figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up, but uh, the transition is difficult <clears throat> for <clears throat> clinicians because military uh, individuals are in good health by definition. And well accepted concepts in the operational arena are frequently not transferable to the clinical situation. <clears throat> the bottom line is <clears throat> excuse me, that history of seizure disorder keeps people out of the chamber. And uh, during my training and even today, if someone has a diabetic foot ulcer, clearly would benefit from going in a chamber or a venous stasis ulcer like the gentleman just described. If they have a history of epilepsy, they were denied treatment in the chamber, and I believe that that may be incorrect. Uh, Richard Neubauer, Paul Harch now, uh, treated many patients with traumatic brain injuries, cerebral palsy, uh, who have associated seizures. And as Paul describes in his <clears throat> excellent book, Oxygen goes everywhere and people are being treated for a foot ulcer, but they have a seizure disorder, they get better. And end stage Parkinson's disease gets up and walks across the room. But we see seizure disorders with this, but when the patient is treated, <clears throat> the seizures often improve significantly. And the question I had, is this a paradox? And that's the reason uh, to uh, take a few minutes of your time this morning. <clears throat> I want to pause here for a moment and talk about another very important paradox in hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And one that is a, I do some vascular surgery in my earlier days, ischemia reperfusion is a very common problem. Little Jessica McClure fell in the well uh, about 20 some years ago and Dr. Maxfield is here with us at the meeting and I'm sure he uh, can fill in more details than I can. But basically this was in Midland, Texas. Little Jessica was a youngster, about 18 months old and fell down this abandoned well and got stuck. 
and she was stuck at a, thank you, thank you. She was stuck at a 35 feet in the well with a foot twisted up underneath her for 54 hours. And uh, this was on national TV, and uh, most of you uh, can remember this. A emergency shaft was sent down, a rescue uh, worker was lowered down and poured in and brought Jessica out, and her foot was severely ischemic. Uh, the orthopedic uh, surgeons felt it couldn't be saved and uh, needed an amputation to save her life. Well, <clears throat> Dr. Maxfield is a pioneer with Dr. Neubauer. Uh, put her in a chamber, and the medical community just became uh, unglued, as only uh, the conservative medical community, and said, this is the worst possible thing to do, because, <clears throat> because we know of all the oxygen-free radical problem. Well, guess what? Uh, Lil Jessica did very well, saved her foot. Uh, graduated from high school a couple years ago and just picturing the news walking down the aisle. Well, what's happening here? Bill Zamboni, who is now the chief of plastic, the chief of surgery at University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, had, an, had an interest in this young researcher at that time, and he had an animal model. I believe it was a frog leg animal model. Uh, for ischemic reperfusion, and this was well worked out. He put the animal model in an animal chamber to demonstrate for all the world that putting little Jessica in the well was the worst possible thing to do. Well, guess what? Bill Zamboni swung from a highly skeptical to a zealot <clears throat> because the animal model did beautifully. And now we had to figure out why that is. Now we understand. The neutrophil, excuse me, in ischemic reperfusion, when flow is reestablished, the neutrophils adhere to the very small post-capillary venules. The blood's moving very slowly through the capillaries, and the neutrophils stick to the endothelium uh, with a ligand 18. And with a single hyperbaric oxygen treatment, the neutrophils no longer stick. The uh, ligand 18 is disabled, reasons are not known at this time. Therefore, the inflammatory response just is not seen. And this is being used all over the country today. Uh, Preoperative Paul talks about that in his book, that it read, if you have a single hyperbaric oxygen treatment before elective surgery, the inflammatory response is much, much less. And oxygen-free radicals are not produced. And this is the paradox. We're giving high-dose oxygen, and we're seeing fewer oxygen-free radicals, which is, I think, very exciting. Well, as a basic small-town country surgeon, <clears throat> I had to learn a little bit about epilepsy if I was going to talk about it. So I went, well, I went to the library, and I'll show you the book I uh, referred to in the next slide. But epilepsy is the most common serious disorder seen by neurologists in the United States, uh, headaches being number one. So it's a very common problem. After I read the book a couple of times, I had coffee with the director of the Epilepsy Center at UCSF, and uh, he confirmed uh, some of the things that were in this book, which I'll go over. This is a uh, picture of the book. It's a very small monogram. And anyone interested in uh, some background on epilepsy, I recommend it to physicians, nurses, and the audience. This one page, <coughs> this one page, uh, I got so excited with reading it, you can see my underline in red. Positron emission tomography in spec, which the next speaker will tell us more about than I uh, certainly can has, this is a molecular imaging. These are functional scans, and they show us just what's happening uh, in the brain. Uh, spec scan primarily blood flow, but PET positron emission tomography uh, is uh, what's happening in the tissue itself metabolically. And basically what this says is for the first time, it was found that seizure foci are ischemic. 
And number two, seizure foci are hypometabolic. And the neurology community uh, is in complete agreement with this because it's irrefutable evidence on, this, on the imaging. This is just a couple of slides from the uh, book uh, to point out. I don't know where I don't have a pointer, but that's okay. You can see in the top image that's an MRI weighted, and uh, these are lesions shown in the second row on PET scan. And uh, they clearly document the uh, hypometabolic effect. Well, to put this together, what's happening? Uh, we take people who are entirely normal. <coughs> they have idiopathic epilepsy. And these are scientists, engineers, lawyers, physicians. Uh, thought to be perhaps congenital. On a three-dimensional EEG, it's possible to localize the seizure focus uh, on CT and MRI. And if you do a spec scan with these individuals, uh, low perfusion is seen. The PET scan uh, documents hypometabolism, and in a simplistic matter, my uh, feeling is that if, uh, two, if this is true, 2 plus 2 equals 4, and low perfusion and hypometabolism is hypoxic. And as I say, the neurological community agrees that seizure foci are hypoxic. The thing that the neurology community does not understand is the role of hyperbaric oxygen in stimulating angiogenesis. As a surgeon, I have been healing, and others around the world, hypoxic, non-healing ischemic wounds for many, many years with intermittent high-dose oxygen. And what I believe is happening with seizure disorders is new blood vessels are growing into the hypoxic tissue of the brain and that's the reason the seizures improve. And in many cases, uh, they actually are cured. Uh, at the present time, uh, we're in the process of putting together a trial. I enjoyed very much the last speaker talking about the stroke trial, which is badly needed, of course. And this is a simple trial looking at seizure patients who are otherwise normal. <clears throat> And once again, we're going to go to battle with the NIH, but hopefully we'll achieve some funding uh, in conjunction with UCSF, of course, with their uh, uh, prestige. But we'll look at probably 10 patients with idiopathic epilepsy and do baseline EEG, spec, and PET to document what's happening. Do 40 uh, treatments <clears throat> over eight weeks. We'll use the standard protocol, 1.5 ATA for 60 minutes at pressure once a day, five days a week for eight weeks, and then do follow-up imaging and see if we can actually demonstrate that what I've been talking about happens. <clears throat> to close, I don't think there's any evidence, I've not been able to find it, that hyperbaric oxygen per se lowers the seizure threshold. I think that's just something that we've all grown up with. There's no doubt in my mind, and the neurological community agrees, that seizure foci are in fact hypoxic. And uh, Tom Hunt and others, uh, Tom Hunt at the University of California, San Francisco, a general surgeon, has written a book on the role of oxygen in uh, uh, surgical wound healing and infection and angiogenesis. And then epilepsy symptoms will be improved. In conclusion, if clinical research supports the uh, comments that I've just put before you, it's quite possible that hyperbaric oxygen therapy will be flipped from now a contraindication to actually an indication for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And if so, the thousands and thousands of patients in the country, United States alone, uh, may benefit tremendously. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. This module was recorded live on July 20th through the 27th in 2008 in Torrance, California at the 2008 HBOT Symposium. Please continue your education on the next module and for more information please go to the web and visit hbot.tv.